have sent institutional positions or views of the Council. Um, some timely highlights I want to quickly mention. Uh, on, on May 31st, we'll host uh, Jeffrey Gettleman from the New York Times. He will reflect on his reporting from the Horn of Africa. On June 19th, we have author Mike Lofgren, uh, Tufts University professor Michael Glennon, and Jerome McDonnell from WBEZ, and they'll explore the concept of the deep state in American politics. And that program has been recorded as an episode of WBEZ's Worldview. Uh, turning back to this evening's program, our panel will discuss the changing policy landscape in the US and abroad uh, with regards to uh, nuclear weapons and, and proliferation. Um, after the panel, we'll open up to your questions, which we'll take from the room and also from our online platform. If you want to ask an online question, just, uh, just type chi.cnf.io into your browser. You'll see that address on the screens uh, circling through. Um, now, by way of introduction of our panelists, this evening we have on the far side, Ivo Dalder, he's the President of the Council on Global Affairs. Uh, next to Ivo is uh, Professor Scott Sagan, he's the Caroline S.G. Monroe Professor of Political Science and the Mimi and Peter Haas University Fellow in Undergraduate Education at Stanford University. Uh, then we have uh, Professor Robert Gallucci, he's the Distinguished Professor in the Practice of Diplomacy at Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service. And our moderator this evening is Rachel Bronson. She is the executive director and publisher of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Uh, please join me in welcoming this evening's panelists. Well, thank you. Can everyone hear okay? The mics are working great. Um, uh, delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you to the council for, for hosting this important conversation. Um, and um, I thought I would kick off with a broad question but before I do that, I just want to make sure um, that you all know kind of who we're talking to here, because I think the council has really put together an amazing um, panel to have this discussion. So I think you know the, the basic bios, but just for the importance of what we're talking about tonight, and I'll just start left and come to right. Um, so Evo Dalder, of course, is former ambassador to NATO, has been thinking about issues of counterproliferation and how to manage a changing Russia. Um, in the context of NATO and U.S. foreign policy, and thinking about it as it's been changing. Um, Scott Sagan has just put out a book uh, which looks at kind of insider threats to all of our kind of assets and infrastructures, including um, our, our nuclear arsenal and how to begin thinking about terrorism um, and nuclear issues, in addition to being uh, one of the foremost scholars within academia and working on these issues. Bob Gallucci was a key negotiator with um, the Koreans, uh, South Koreans vis-a-vis -vis North Korea during the Clinton administration and was really instrumental in forging one of the few uh, times when we've had successes in beginning to rein back um, a, a program. So we have the very good fortune of having a, a top-notch uh, conversation uh, today and I'm delighted to help moderate it. So to kick off, um, the fact that this room is full suggests that we all know something is changing and it's becoming increasingly dangerous. And as we, um, about a week ago, were kind of planning how to talk about this evening's conversation, we thought it would be important to lay out some of the basic and important changes that we've been seeing. Because I think that there is a sense that we know things are dangerous and things are very different, but how to make sense of the fact that we suddenly have seven recent North Korean uh, missile tests and the Russians seem to be um, within their, their defense posture using nuclear weapons again. What's the landscape? So talking a little bit, laying it out so we have some sense of what we're talking about and if we're lucky, we'll end up with a little bit of a conversation of what can we do about it. So uh, my opening question, um, for the three of you is when you look out on this fast-changing world through the lens of a potential nuclear arms race, what are you seeing that concerns you the most and you think that we should all be watching as well? So, Evo, let me start with you. Well, thanks, thanks Rachel, and thanks, uh, uh, Bob and Scott, for, for joining us here today. It's uh, an important subject that tends to not be discussed except in in a crisis situation when it all of a sudden hits CNN breaking news, although everything on CNN is breaking news. <laughs> um, you know, what I, what I worry about when I look at sort of what has changed. Um, when the Cold War ended, we thought that the nuclear arms race would sort of disappear and we could, uh, we could start thinking about how to reduce nuclear weapons. And, and in 2008, I even wrote an article about the logic of zero and supported a presidential candidate who 
uh, uh, who came from this city, who actually for the, for the first time campaigned on the notion of abolishing nuclear weapons. And that wasn't crazy. Uh, in fact, he got elected uh, uh, and made his first big speech as a foreign policy speech uh, in the Prague speech in 2009 on getting rid of nuclear weapons, living in the world where, where uh, the, the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. And the reason we had that optimism is because the, the Soviet Union had disappeared and Russia had become a, uh, a more respectable partner. And what we've seen in the last two or three years is a Russia that is coming back as a major threat uh, in, in conventional sense, given its invasion of Ukraine, its annexation of Crimea, a, a kind of steps that we haven't seen in international politics in Europe uh, for a, a very long time, and well before the Cold War. Uh, uh, ended, uh, this kind of behavior we hadn't seen. And then add to that a behavior with regard to nuclear weapons that we hadn't seen since the 1960s. And we are seeing it again in a way that uh, suggests a, a lack of responsibility about the management of these extraordinary weapons, one of which, as the saying goes, can really ruin your whole day. Uh, two of those can destroy the world. Uh, and it is that behavior. And what specifically? The Russians are flying nuclear bombers, by the way, 1950s age nuclear bombers, to uh, along our shores in the Atlantic, across the Bering Straits, down the North Sea in between uh, the U United Kingdom and, and the continent uh, on a regular basis. Their submarines are once again, um, nuclear submarines are once again rushing out of Murmansk port and other ports in a way that they did during the Cold War. They have deployed nuclear capable missiles uh, along the border with uh, Eastern Europe, including uh, in Kaliningrad, a little outgrowth in between Poland and Lithuania. Uh, uh, and those missiles are capable of reaching Berlin. Uh, they have violated. Uh, the one treaty that ended the Cold War and began this, this uh, a new uh, relationship between the East and West, the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, not only by testing a weapon that is not allowed uh, to be tested, but actually deploying it. Uh, and they have announced in their nuclear doctrine quite openly uh, that uh, they see nuclear escalation as a means to combat and win wars. This is language and behavior that really, you know, the, that we saw in the 1960s. Uh, and we, we, we popularized through Failsafe, the movie, or Dr. Strangelove. Uh, uh, great movies. And, you know, my kids watched the movie. They thought it was really boring. They didn't really get it. Um, but now we are back to a situation where the possibility, not of deliberate attack, but of accidents, accidents that can escalate uh, airplanes that get shot down or, or taken down or what have you. Uh, and somehow we don't have the controls, we don't have the communication capabilities, we don't have the, the confidence building measures, we don't frankly have the, the, the historical knowledge to de-escalate, to find ways uh, to manage uh, nuclear crises in the way that we learned in the 50s and the 60s a knowledge that in the last 20, 25 years uh, has disappeared. So in NATO, where I was the ambassador from 09 to 13, uh, we would do nuclear exercises, uh, uh, command table exercises, once a year. They were a joke, because nobody knew anything about how to think about nuclear weapons, because that knowledge didn't exist within the system in the way that it had been part of the system until uh, the late 1980s. So that's what I'm worried about. I'm worried about the system that still exists, these Cold War arsenals that are on both sides uh, exist, that, that somehow something can happen to trigger uh, the, the cataclysm that in 1989 we thought we'd left behind. Scott, how about you when you look out across? Well, one word that did not come up uh, in Evo's um, frightening set of scenarios was terrorism. and. If I look at the area where I think nuclear war is more likely, I'd say it's in South Asia because of two aspects of 
nuclear terrorism. What is, I think, India and Pakistan are a terrorist attack away from a major crisis. The Pakistani military has not totally forsworn helping jihadi terrorists who attack India and go into Kashmir or elsewhere. And if there's another attack like the one that took place in the Indian parliament or the one that attacked Mumbai a number of years ago, Bombay, um, the Indians now say and have developed some capability that they're going to respond quickly in what's called the cold start attack, going after the bases or even punishing Pakistani military conventionally. The Pakistanis say that they have a new capability and a new doctrine. They're going to be developing tactical nuclear weapons. And if Indian forces cross the line of patrol or the international border, that they will face the prospect of being destroyed with nuclear weapons. The Indians say that they will respond with a large scale retaliation, a massive retaliation like we did and said we would do in the 1950s. The Pakistanis say the Indians are bluffing. The Indians say the Pakistanis are bluffing. And when you have two states both th saying that the other side's threats are bluffs, that's not a good situation to be in, very dangerous. Moreover, the terrorism problem exists in a different way inside Pakistan. The Pakistani military knows that they've got a real internal terrorist problem. Jihadi terrorists, the Pakistani Taliban, has attacked the headquarters of the Pakistani military. They have had constant fights back and forth between people in the Pakistani military and jihadi terrorists. Knowing that there's a threat that a jihadi could get a nuclear weapon, the Pakistani military routinely keeps its nuclear weapons in storage igloos on military bases, not putting them with their missiles or their bombers, because they want to keep them locked up and safe because of a potential terrorist seizure. If there's a crisis, like the one I just suggested would happen if there's a terrorist attack inside India, the Pakistani military can't do that because the Indians know where those bases are. So they have every incentive, and they have plans, and they have exercised those plans, to take the nuclear weapons out and put them out into the field, where they would be less vulnerable to an Indian attack, but they'd be far more vulnerable to a Pakistani terrorist, either with insider help or not, seizing them. So I think if you look out at the world, there are a number of serious dangers, but we should not take our eye off of India and Pakistan because I think that's where the triggers are the quickest. So Bob, surely that can't be it. There's got to be more to worry about. <laughs> I know what my job is now, and that is to talk about North Korea. <laughs> and I'm going to do that, but uh, a word for what my colleagues just said. There's a sense I think some of us have that it's, it's nuclear weapons, colon, they're back. There is that for a long time we had, as Eva was, I think, suggesting, we had thought this had been managed in early in the 90s. And now what you're hearing, you just heard, is it's not managed. The, you know, Evo could have said, and he probably will, that there's something very exciting the North Koreans have in their declaratory policy. It is the Russians. It is escalate to de-escalate. I mean, the Russians actually have written in journals and elsewhere that the, one of the best ways to deal with a crisis on their borders that they might not have the conventional capability to deal with because of the overwhelming American capability to project force with lethality and precision, they would go to nuclear weapons first, early, and not necessarily locally. In their declaratory policy, they might use them on US soil first in order to de-escalate the crisis. Think about that. Think about how de-escalating a, a, a Russian strike on Iowa would be. So there seems to be something they don't quite get here. The South Asian thing that Scott spoke to, this goes to the whole nuclear terrorism thing. All the I watched for reasons I'm not entirely clear last night, some of all fears for the 13th time. And, <laughs> and I, I'm reminded of this. The Pakistani nuclear weapons program 
is the fastest growing nuclear weapons program in the world today. They have more than 100 nuclear weapons, closer maybe to 150 nuclear weapons. Pakistan, just that's almost enough to know to think you better go home tonight, you know, soon. All right. And then we come to uh, a country these days where we love to talk about, it, and that is North Korea. And I, what I want to say to you about North Korea is that the leadership uh, is, I think, broadly understood to want to continue to be the leadership, that we may not know a lot about internal thinking in North Korea or whether it extends beyond one person, but we think that they think that regime survival is the most important thing. That's sort of where many briefings uh, inside government and out outside government begin. And what did we just hear? We just heard the, in, a, in a New Year's address by Kim Jong-un, we heard him say that we are close, we the North Koreans, DPRK, close to having the capability to mate a nuclear weapon, of which they have 10, 15 of, with an intercontinental ballistic missile which could target, range, the continental United States. They're close to being able to test that weapon, and they expect to test it soon. And you know that the uh, tweeter in chief responded to that with not going to happen. Not Shakespeare, but it got, a, it, it, <laughs> it got across the idea that, that something that was is it, part of a progression of ballistic missile tests and development the way other, lots of other countries have developed ballistic missiles, that somehow this was going to stop, which made a lot of us who have been looking at North Korea for decades, literally, wonder what did the president have in mind? Was he going to be the negotiator in chief and launch negotiations? Did his secretary of state say that when he went to Asia? Well, he didn't say they wouldn't, but didn't say they would. I don't actually know is one of the strange things. But what I want to tell you is we are hours, possibly, away from a crisis in the use of nuclear weapons. Hours because all it takes is for the DNI, Director of National Intelligence, to walk into the Oval Office when the President comes home and say there's going to be a ballistic missile test and it may not be an MRBM, medium range ballistic missile test, and it may not be an IRBM. This could be the solid fueled ICBM test, which would be the first in a progression. Not that I'm saying, Mr. President, there'd be a warhead there, a nuclear warhead, but this would be what you, forgive me, Mr. President, tweeted wouldn't happen. This would be that test. Now, what would we do? Would the president say, well, it's OK. Let them test and develop. Or would the president want to do something about it? What I'm, I'm here to tell you tonight is he doesn't have the option of shooting it down once it's launched. He might. I mean, we have ballistic missile defense, both regional and continental. But I, I, to, not to mince words, and my colleagues might want to fix this, but they don't work. I mean, which is to say that not with any confidence anyway, and certainly not against more than one warhead when you don't have all the telemetry information before the flight, and the North Koreans probably won't provide it. So <laughs> if you're going to intervene in that scenario, you're going to have to strike, and uh, Scott and I were talking about this, the, the term of art, if this is really art, that's used these days is left of launch. So that would be a US conve presumably conventional strike if we had the warning and if we had assets in place at a target in North Korea. What's your model of this, of the North Koreans? That we do that and they do nothing? That's a pretty good model. But I don't know that you should have confidence in that. And what I'm saying to you is, if you really want to stop the North Korean program from developing into one which has it manifests itself with a capability to strike American targets with nuclear weapons, and you want to do it by the use of force, you should be prepared for another Korean War. And that can happen any day. So if you have another plan, 
and its containment, which is what we've been engaging with for a long time, that's going to take a while, right? And it's not going to stop the launch. That leads you, perhaps, to think about prescription other than the use of force or doing nothing. And that we can maybe come to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I want to uh, shift just a little bit um, and talk about, in, this, in the same kind of regional sense that we have been, um, modernization. This is a term that we keep seeing in the papers, and everybody's talking about it, that um, every nuclear power is modernizing their force. It's a very clean and nice way to say they're investing very heavily in, new nuclear, in, in nuclear forces. And some are looking at this and saying it's not just keeping them safe and modern, but actually creating uh, nuclear arsenals 2.0, entirely new ar arsenals. So the U.S. Um, is about to launch a uh, trillion dollars over 30 years, every other. How are, what should we be watching for in um, these modernization campaigns that are destabilizing? What are you seeing that is saying these aren't just keeping them safe, but this is why um, regardless of where you look, there's reason to be concerned that we're making the world more stable and not less stable. We can just start with Evo, or we can just. I mean, I think one of the one of the worries we've had in the in in, in this business is a worry that leaders who have the capacity to decide on launching nuclear weapons look at nuclear weapons as just another kind of weapon, a bigger bang for the buck, uh, as we turned it in the 1950s. And one of the things that emerged over time, certainly in the United States and, uh, and the Soviet Union, now Russia, and I think true for all the established nuclear powers, including France and the United Kingdom and China, was the sense that actually nuclear weapons are not like any other weapon. It's not just a bigger bang for the buck. It is a, a, it is a fundamentally different kind of weapon. It's a weapon of mass destruction. And the other weapons of mass destruction, chemical and biological, we had banned. Maybe not totally successfully, but we at least created a norm that possessing these weapons was somehow not something that civilized countries did. And the use of nuclear weapons is Tom Schelling, uh, probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, nuclear strategist of our times, of any time because uh, there hasn't been a nuclear age that long, uh, w talked about, including in this Nobel address, was the idea of a taboo, that somehow leaders had internalized the notion that using nuclear weapons was just not done. There was a taboo. And our fear about proliferation, about terrorism, and in some ways about modernization and development of new weapons is that ta taboo is broken that someone will either require nuclear weapons who doesn't believe that you can't use them, that they're not weapons you can't use, or that we create technologies that allow us to use nuclear weapons because they're really not that bad. Remember in the 1970s we had the enhanced radiation warhead, the neutron bomb. Kills people but not property. That was the Marxist version of it. Uh, 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 but this idea was it was killing through radiation rather through, than through a blast. And why were we against it? Because, not because it left property standing and only killing people, but because it seemed to make, make nuclear weapons more, quote, usable. Uh, and, and the usability of nuclear weapons is the one thing that we should fear. Mm -hmm. It's the extraordinary nature of the weapons that allows mutual assured destruction, mm -hmm. deterrence. Everything that we have uh, created over time really work. That's the, one, that's the area that I, I worry about. I worry about the idea that there is technology that allows you to use these weapons, that make them just another bigger bang for the buck. Um, let me discuss something that Ivo just mentioned that I think is a, a myth. And that's the idea that among the public that there's a taboo against using nuclear weapons. I know the council does a lot of polling, but I don't think you've done exactly what I'm going to report on now. Since 1945, almost every summer, there's been some poll that says, did Harry Truman do the right thing? And they'll ask the question a little bit differently. Um, and it's shown that if you just say, was it a right or wrong thing, a yes or no, 
Support for using nuclear weapons against Japan in 1945 was supported by 85% of the public in 1945. Today, if you ask that question, it's about 45%. So it's been a big sea change. And that's led people like Nina Tannenwald, Professor Brown, to say there's a taboo. It's led Thomas Schelling in his um, Nobel Prize for Economics speech to talk about the legacy, of uh, uh, the universal revulsion against nuclear weapons. None of those polls ever put people in a situation where they had to contemplate the use of American conventional force in a invasion of another country where lots of Americans would get killed versus dropping a bomb to kill innocent people in another country until now. So Professor Ben Valentino and I hired YouGov, the polling firm, to get a set of representative samples of the American public and had them imagine reading a story that Iran violated the Iran deal. In this story, the United States put sanctions back on, and the Iranian Air Force attacks a US ship in the Persian Gulf, killing 2,406 people. Just happens to be the same number of sailors who died at Pearl Harbor. Congress declares war. President calls for unconditional surrender. And the chairman of the Joint Chiefs says, we can invade, but we'll lose 20,000 people. We'll win the war. But it's going to be a big, messy war. But we'll win. 20,000 US GIs estimated fatalities. Or we can drop a nuclear weapon on the second largest city of Iran, Moshad. And the experiment was that different control groups got different numbers of people who would be killed. From 100,000, which is roughly what happened in Hiroshima, up to 2 million, where we thought, by 2 million, we're going to see a big drop off. We were shocked. 60% of the public supported nuclear weapons use in that condition with 100,000, killing 100,000 innocent people. 2 million people, 60% of the public still supported it. Republicans were more hawkish than Democrats, not surprising. Older people were more hawkish than young people, not surprising. Women were as hawkish as men. We know from lots of polling that women tend not to be as hawkish when it comes to support to go to war or wanting to get out of wars. But when it came to protecting USGIs, at the 2 million level, they were more hawkish, a larger percentage of them. The single largest variable in our questionnaire that correlates with whether you wanted to use nuclear weapons or not was whether you supported the domestic death penalty. Did you agree with the statement that convicted prisoners should be subject to a death penalty. What's going on there? There's a sense among the American public of a righteous retaliation, a righteous retribution. The Iranians started this war. 70% of the people who supported using nuclear weapons in that condition said the Iranian public deserved responsibility for us dropping the bomb on them because they had not overthrown their own public. One of my mm -hmm. colleagues finds this evidence, he said, uh, shocking but not surprising. That is, there's something about the public. So I hope that the American leadership has a strong taboo against using nuclear weapons, because the public does not. And the public, if anything, today would be a goad. It wouldn't be a restraint on any president who had to make a decision about using nuclear weapons in a crisis. So we'd like to send you to Moscow to brief them so about uh, escalating to de-escalate. Yeah. <laughs> that would be very useful. The American public would demand vengeance, mm -hmm. and we have the means of doing it, as uh, George Bush once told Saddam Hussein. So picking up on this, we had, one of the things we had talked about uh, is, is thinking about our current president in, in this. Um, what we've heard during the campaign and what some of his backers have um, used to support him is that it can be very effective to be a madman when, uh, or have the reputation of being a madman when being the commander in chief. This was the madman theory. Was it Shelley that came up with this around Richard, Richard Nixon? Nixon. Uh, right, that's Dan what. Dan Ellsberg came up with right. the idea first, and then Nixon caught on and tried to uh, take advantage of that during the Vietnam and War. And the idea being that he was so crazy that he kind of threw the steering wheel out of a moving car so the other countries would have to get out of the way. So maybe um, we're in this situation, Bob, where 
the madman theory, based on what Scott has said, is, um, could be effective, um, especially against some of the regimes we're talking about. So Maybe we've been too soft. There's, there's too much here to comment on. I mean, I'm just, <laughs> so uh, yes, I, 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 well, the problem is if you got two cars that are speeding and that's the metaphor for the North Koreans right now in the United States of America, and arguably both are adopting the madman theory, right? Uh, and they both throw their steering wheels out the window. <laughs> then, then what do you have? Uh, it's not good, I can, I'm, I'm certain. <laughs> but you, a little bit ago, Rachel, you, you put a public policy question on the table for everybody to talk about. And that, and that was whether, it was kind of, do you want the United States of America, after we had, on our opening comments, we did the, you know, you're all, you're all gonna die of nuclear weapons or something. But, but the question was, do you want arms control? Do you want uh, the United States of America and, uh, and, I don't know, everybody else, one other country, to engage in reducing numbers of nuclear weapons? And are there some nuclear weapons that are more destabilizing and more dangerous than other nuclear weapons? Is it the delivery system? Are some provocative and some others not so bad? And Evo, um, I, I don't know whether S Scott coined the phrase, he may have, and you can say this, you know, went to the immediately to the paradox of, of the making your nuclear weapons more usable so that they don't have to be used. You, I, I hope this resonates with some of you, the idea that if you have just really big, ugly weapons that just kill everything, um, that's not very credible. If particularly if you want to extend deterrence to your allies and say, well, we'll come to your defense, we'll use a nuclear weapon if necessary. Well, if the nuclear weapon is going to kill a bazillion people, you might not be so credible. But if you had small nuclear weapons, precise nuclear weapons, then a president can be sane, maybe, in a certain circumstance and use that. And because he could, they're more usable, but because he could, deterrence is supported. He's more credible, threatening to use that weapon. Therefore, he doesn't have to use it. A paradox, wouldn't you say? I would say. And, he's, and, and so Scott has written eloquently on that subject. And Evo, to his credit, addressed that paradox and picked the side and said, he didn't actually say this, but I'm going to help you out. I need it. I need it. Evo essentially said, I, I don't know about other presidents, I don't want this guy to have that choice of a usable nuclear weapon, right? I, I, this right, is, I didn't say that. You didn't, Evo he did not say that. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. So, so that we can have this conversation, let me say that. There's a problem <laughs> with, with this of, of, of doing that. But you, you understand that if you asked President Obama, you can ask, he's going to come back to the city, he's not here already. He's, all, he is, he's the guy who, as Rachel said, said, okay, we're going to do arms control, we're going to make this deal with the Russians, but we're going to do a trillion dollars over 30 years of modernization to make them safe, secure, and effective, the, the, that criteria. That would mean that these weapons are going to be precise, they're going to be usable, and when we say we might use it, we are more credible, therefore we won't have to use it. That's, I mean, that's what's behind all that. How do you feel about that? Are you up for that? Do you want a trillion dollars spent on your strategic nuclear weapons? Now get this, this is, we're not doing this alone. The Russians, an, an estimate was half a trillion dollars over 10 years. Right? So they're, and they're not just modernizing. They're getting new stuff and they're doing different kinds of things and some provocative things with their weapons. So I think the public policy question for y'all, for us, is what do you want? presidents and administrations to do about our nuclear weapons? Do you want us to try to get the Russians, hit the reset button again, pound on the reset button, get into another negotiation and reduce the numbers lower? Or are you worried about the others building up? The Chinese aren't even playing? What about tactical nuclear weapons? So there's lots of stuff in here um, to worry about. And it's, it's actually, I think, conceptually pretty complicated. I think at the end of the day, I, you could probably sign us all up for, for definitions of greater stability, particularly in a crisis. You can say, okay, I don't want a lot of first strike capability running around on the Russian side. 
I, I know, secure a second strike, and this is, these are terms of art and deterrence. Sounds a little better, sounds a little safer. So please, Russians, when you're modernizing, don't build multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles and put them on one missile, which is, a, is designated, this is a first strike weapon to start the war. That's bad, you know, that's a bad thing to do. So if you get into the nuts and bolts of this, there, there may be some prescription you can extract out of it, but it is complicated stuff. So we're, so we're actually moving to the part of our discussion of what can we do about it. And there's so many issues we haven't um, talked about. But maybe um, staying on this issue of what do the three of you see at this moment of stabilizing or destabilizing. And I, I say that, I ask that because if you look at the global architecture, the kind of arms control agreements that we've signed and have led us to believe we're, have led us to a more secure Place, they're crumbling. And the likelihood of getting anything new is so low. And this is what an arms race looks like, right? Everybody's investing. The architecture doesn't seem to be um, uh, relevant to the current situation. There's no innovation because there's no trust. It's all going in the wrong direction. That's what, to me, is so terrifying about this. Um, and so thank you for all staying in the room for the, this conversation and not heading for the hills. They're but heading for the bar. As we, is what they're <laughs> <laughs> the bartender's That's delighted. Right. <laughs> so, so how can we begin to think about what is possibly stabilizing in a world where investments seem to be increasing, um, countries are breaking their agreements, as we heard in, in the beginning, Countries that we didn't even anticipate being part of the conversation or in the conversation, terrorism is a factor. What looks stabilizing that might be something that we can build off of? Do, are there thoughts on this? I'm sure you have. Any silver about. linings? I, I, I could start because I think there are, are two that I, I would uh, mention. One is that the Obama administration made as one of their signature goals to reduce the amount of fissile material that was out there in re research reactors and other forms, and to have a number of states get together every two years to talk about how to reduce the risk of nuclear terrorism. And I think they did a really good job. Two meetings, summits in the United States, one in South Korea, one in the Netherlands. So there's a lot less stuff for terrorists to, see, to seize. It doesn't mean that it's not still a problem, doesn't mean that someone couldn't go after a weapon, but, but it was, it's improved and that was one silver lining. And I hope that somehow that process, it won't continue as a set of summit meetings, but that I hope that something will continue there. Um, second, um, I think the Iran deal was a major achievement. And the fact that a new president who said it was the worst deal of all time hasn't broken it, means that Secretary Mattis and others have been successful in convincing him that this might be worthwhile if we might have a problem with Iran. But it's a lot better to have a problem with Iran when they don't have nuclear weapons than to start a problem with them and have them get nuclear weapons as a result of us walking out of the deal, which is what would happen if it was done unilaterally. Mm -hmm. So those are two small silver linings on what I think is largely a pretty dark cloud. Let me, let me build on, 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 on Scott's second piece, because I do think we, we have a long history that we can go back to and say, what, what, what do we learn from that? And one of the things that we learned is when the Soviet Union and the United States got into a really, really big crisis. 1962, Cuban Missile Crisis. As Dean Rusk said, we stood at the brink of nuclear war and blinked. The other guy did, or maybe not, but somebody blinked and we walked back. And out of that came a process by which both sides realized that communication is the first way back from whatever brink one might get to. And out of that came not so much great arms control agreements, there came a dialogue that lasted 30 years in which two sides sat next to each other on a day-to-day -day basis to talk about how to manage this problem. 
And it wasn't that you couldn't have more than a thousand nuclear warheads on missiles. It was that we sat down and talked about it. And so we created a process of confidence building through that dialogue. And we haven't had that dialogue since 2010 with the Russians. Um, and we've kind of abandoned them. So the first thing, although I, I'll, I won't take a backseat to anybody, believing that the Russians pose a very severe threat, but the first thing I would do is find a way back to dialogue. How can we talk to them? Hopefully at a technical, military to military level, uh, where we have a dialogue to say, let's at least agree not to go to any war that we don't want. We may want to go to a war, and then that we do want, but let's not go to war when we don't want it. Uh, let's make that the first step. And, and, and there actually are mechanisms for this. There is the NATO-Russia Council. There's a council where NATO and Russia used to get together and talk about these things, which uh, we shut down, I think, mistakenly uh, in, uh, in response to the Ukrainian crisis. You actually want to talk more when you are in a crisis rather than less. And that's the Iran model. Let's talk to people. It's the Korea model in 1993 and 94 that, that, that Bob led so successfully. It creates not trust. It creates confidence and predictability. And that's much more. So I'd much rather spend a trillion dollars on modernizing nuclear weapons if we have a process where we have confidence that the likelihood of anybody using them is significantly less than not talking and not spending money on nuclear weapons. So it, I do think talking, the process of engaging, which we have engaged in with the Russians and, and the First Soviet Union from 1963 until 2010, and we haven't really done since, is something that we need to look towards to resolve fundamentally this issue. And actually extend it to other nuclear powers and have this in a much more extensive way, but it's, it's, it's about dialogue. And, and just um, to, to pick up on, on that, the, the Russians didn't show up for the, um, for the last summit. They, didn't, they weren't part of the NATO summit when, when it was here in Chicago. Is there, are there ways to do this when they're so flagrantly not sitting down with us? So you, are don't there want, ways you don't want to do it in the summit. Mm -hmm. You want to do it very quietly. You want uh, you want the ships that are sailing too close to each other having captains talking to each other and making sure that they don't bump into each other. You want, you, you want to encourage fighters to have their transponders on so you can actually look at where the aircraft are when they're flying near you. You want to have a communication channel. I mean, what happened? Well, the Russian airplane that was shot down by the Turks, they turned their transponder, which is the way you know where the aircraft is, and they didn't, and they turned off their emergency frequency channel, so you couldn't talk to them. So when the Turks tried to say, hey, you're flying in the wrong place, they didn't respond. Now, whether you shoot that plane down or not is a different matter. But if you don't have the communication channels, that basic, uh, that basic tactical level, and then you push it up strategically. If you start, well, and then I've come to summits, then let's not have captain talking to captain, then you're never going to get anywhere. So it's that lower level of operational engagement uh, that is that ultimately is what stops the war from escalating uh, and the nuclear bomb from going on. Bob, you've you've led a process about where it seemed like there was no um, kind of way to begin to to move in a different uh, direction. You were able to to do it. Is there anything that we can apply from that to now, or have you, I'm, I know you've been thinking of, about this current situation. So I think I think what. Scott and Evo have been saying is correct, and I just I want to associate myself with it, uh, what they said, uh, which is to say that I don't think you can have sort of an antiseptic uh, weapons-oriented engagement that's going to really make a huge difference. If it, it, by antiseptic, I mean non-political. I mean, there is going to be a political component to this that goes at the security interests. You know, it, India and Pakistan, you can, yes, you can have conversations and you can do technical um, things that go to reducing tensions, so hotlines and notifications. But if, you, if, if you're not ultimately aiming at Kashmir as an issue, the South Asian situation is not going to be fundamentally and durably changed. 
us and the Chinese. There's lots we can do if we don't make sure that we've managed Taiwan contingencies that they plan for all the time, we will not have done what we need to do. The European situation has huge gray areas, and Ukraine was a gray area as far as the Russians are concerned. If we don't go back to what we did with NATO expansion and eventually engage the Russians, I think talking about the strategic arms control and reducing numbers of warheads is not going to be enough. The North Korean case that Rachel is referring to uh, more than two decades ago now was a case where we really tried to isolate this. We tried to do exactly the opposite of what I'm saying and just focus on the plutonium problem in North Korea. And the durability of, of that agreement, which as agreements go wasn't so bad, eight or nine years, but it ultimately failed because the political base wasn't there. And I think if we learned anything from that, and I'm not sure we did, except for some people, negotiations don't work. Wrong answer. The, the right answer is a negotiation that has a huge technical component to it, and that deal certainly did, did not have a durable political base. And the North Koreans never got out of that the assurance that the United States was not going to launch regime change. Uh, it, it just never happened. Right now, if you took us and the Russians, there's enormous concern about American ballistic missile defense. Now, a few minutes ago, I told you what I thought of American missile, <laughs> ballistic missile defense right now. I'm not saying it won't eventually work, but a, a good public policy question for you is, do you want the United States of America to field an effective ballistic missile defense and undercut mutual assured destruction because you will have a ballistic missile defense, which will, of course, prompt the Russians and the Chinese to develop an offense to try to overcome that defense. And we'll be off to the races again. Or would you rather manage the political competition in a way that makes that kind of calculation inappropriate for the relationship? I pick B myself, and I, that's what I, I heard Evo saying. So we're out of time from the podium, from the stage, and now it's time to um, bring you all into the conversation. So um, normal council protocol um, continues, which is please uh, raise your hand. Uh, I'll recognize you, wait for the mic, ask a question, um, and we're, we're off. So who's, who's gonna ask the first question? Because we have plenty from, uh, from the social, from social media, yes, please, right here. Just wait for the mic, it's on its way. So great dialogue, thank you. I feel like if we were here three years, four years ago, we would be talking about Iran. You know, we barely really touched on it tonight. Is that because the agreement that's in place is effective or are there just bigger problems? A little bit of both. Um, you know, right now, the International Atomic Energy Agency inspections on Iran say that the deal's working well, that Iran has kept all of its commitments, and they are much further away from a capability to get nuclear weapons than they were before this deal struck. That is, they've shut down uh, the Iraq reactor, and they've um, limited the amount of, of uh, medium-enriched uranium, and not enriching more. So I think that's been a big success. Now, the United States presidential candidate, Trump, said that he was going to rip it up. But Secretary Mattis, in uh, his confirmation hearings, talked about how if we did that unilaterally, the other countries who were necessary to get the sanctions to work won't rip up the deal because they think we are the ones who would have destroyed it when the Iranians were doing a good job of keeping their side of the bargain. So as long as that basic situation exists, I think Iran is much further away from a nuclear weapon than uh, they were uh, before this deal would happen. Now the question is what happens in 10 years? And Iran still would be required under the non-proliferation treaty, a treaty that they have signed and ratified, not to seek to acquire nuclear weapons, but they could start enriching uranium again to higher levels. The United States could, in 10 years, do what we were doing then, a couple years ago, saying, if you keep going, we're going to have an attack. 
I would rather have that 10 year space. That's a good time not to have to worry about that problem. So that's why we're not talking about Iran as much today. There's some great questions coming in from social media and one we haven't uh, touched on directly, but um, it, it, someone asks, how vulnerable are nuclear weapon systems to cyber hacking? Who wants to take that one? Scott, that's, I mean, can't I tell you. Can't tell you. No. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Scott. Um, there is a, a lot of work um, being done on um, vulnerability of command and control uh, capabilities. It's not so much a, a, a danger of a weapon itself um, somehow being hacked, but of different command and control procedures um, that could be miscommunication could happen, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of money being spent on that. Where I think the biggest vulnerability there is, is the hacking of public fears or confidence or things that could occur in a crisis. If we're worried about someone in a future crisis being pressured by the US public, the idea that the public might be subject to false news about things that are happening, that could be a really serious issue. So while I can't say much about the actual cyber connections to, say, the, the command system that would order nuclear weapons, I can say that there is definitely vulnerability of our knowledge about what's happening in a crisis, and that's really worrisome. Mm -hmm. Yes, please, right here. Let's wait for the mic. Uh, so tell me about the mental math about having personalities involved in this uh, as opposed to what in the past may have been a little bit more logical uh, gamesmanship, if you will, um, and how that has played out over the last, I guess, well, probably starting five to six years ago, but being very exacerbated now. Is that a question about our present? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I actually uh, thought you might have been thinking about the leader of North Korea. Um, so, um, one of the things about these people, wholly apart from whether they're stable and make the kind of calculations that are required for traditional deterrence theory to work out right, is a, a question of, of how much they actually know. Uh, certainly, we're talking about Kim Jong Un. About what is what is what does he think nuclear weapons are good for? I mean, we went through a long evolutionary period. First, we thought they were good for everything. I mean, massive retaliation. Anybody does something we don't like, we'll just threaten to nuke them. And and then we found out that wasn't very credible. Then we got worried that they weren't good good for everything. Maybe they were good for nothing. Could we defend Europe with nuclear weapons by threatening to use them if there was a conventional war in Europe and NATO couldn't stop the Warsaw Pact? So how do you extend deterrence? So it took a long time for us and the Soviets at the time to, in a course of negotiations, arms control negotiations, to learn all this stuff. But we haven't done that with Kim Jong-un, and he's not a very old guy, and he's has done some things which make us think he's a little strange and volatile. So what does he think his nuclear weapons are good for? And he has some. And that's a concern. Does he believe, for example, that he can do the kinds of things North Koreans are sort of famous for, uh, sink a ship, shell an island, do something in the DMZ, and believe now that he's done these missile tests and nuclear weapons and shown people the orb and stuff, that he's untouchable, right? He can deter anything. And soon, he'll be able to even deter the United States of America. Is that what he's thinking? I mean, with, the, with Putin, you know what, uh, you could have met Putin in this, there's a tradition behind him. Yes, he's exciting, uh, but it's a different kind of thing. I would say if we did not have, and they've been referred to as, a, as the gang of three, um, and, and, uh, Tillis, uh, McMaster, and uh, Mattis, we might be worrying about it here too, because there are an awful lot of people who have never been in government, don't know anything about any of this stuff, and are proud of it. 
interestingly. But we have all this capability. So what I would say when you go to this is not, you don't need to get to the are they crazy thing. You just have to get to whether, Evo said before, let's just fight wars that we want to fight. Is it possible we can all agree that we don't want to fight wars we don't want to fight? And the, a, a concern right now with the North Korean side is that the possibility of escalation because of huge miscalculation seems very much in zone for the level of ignorance we're dealing with. Not stupidity, ignorance. So there's a great uh, question from social media, kind of a perennial one, but um, when looking at recent events in Libya and Ukraine, why should the North Koreans give up their nuclear weapons? They shouldn't. <laughs> they won't. They will. And okay. they <laughs> Good. I think they should, but I don't think, I think they look at events in Libya and Ukraine, and they're worried about it. Now, unless there was some major deal that could bring North Korea to a level of prosperity and a deep belief that the United States is not trying to change the regime, then I think they've got every incentive to keep their nuclear weapons. Of course. So unless you can make that kind of deal, how are you going to make yes. it, Bob? How okay. are you going to make that deal? So here's the deal. Um, the, the question's on point. The, uh, North Koreans in more than one venue, as recently as this summer, told me that they watched the U.S. in Iraq they said twice, which I thought was a little gratuitously. Uh, gratuitous. and, and then in Libya, I didn't mention Ukraine in, this, in the last version of this conversation. And they said, we thought, I mean, they have a, by the way, you must know, we have a narrative about what happened uh, in 1994 to the agreed framework. And we say they cheated on the deal. And then we ultimately, in the Bush administration, the deal was, was, was um, disbanded or ignored or crushed. The North Korean narrative is different. The North Korean narrative is that they made a deal in which they thought they were giving up their nuclear weapons <coughs> option. Yeah, they might have been doing a little hedging on the highly enriched uranium side. But fundamentally, the plutonium side, they were giving up this option, a near-term option of having at least 100 nuclear weapons by the year 2000 for a new relationship with the United States of America. For a new, and they didn't get that. You may all recall or not that 1994 was a midterm election, and the Democrats lost big time. And all the committees switched just when the agreement was signed with the North Koreans. I have to tell you, as the one who was going to the Hill at the time, all of a sudden, uh, wonderful times on the Hill turned into very difficult times on the Hill, and there was going to be no initiative for a new relationship with North Korea in 1994, 95, and 96, which is when the North Koreans slammed palm into Farhead and began to do the, the deed that they did with the Pakistanis and begin, from our perspective, to cheat on the deal. So to go to Scott's proposition and Evo's, it is true that if we cannot address scratch that itch of the North Koreans that somehow they've managed to get confidence and an American assurance that we are not going to change their regime. Because remember, they see us as the, the capability to project force with incredible lethality and precision and do what we want, when we want it. UN doesn't matter. Regional security doesn't matter. It just matters what Washington decides. So how can they get confidence in us and the North Korean answer to that, there is no way. That's why we will be nuclear weapon state forever. The way to change that is to say, wait, South Korea does not have nuclear weapons. In fact, is an ally of the United States of America. How do we get from here to there? If you're an international theorist, uh, you know, structural realist here on, on uh, uh, international politics, you, South Korea and North Korea are contiguous. You might have noticed that. So there's no structural difference between North Korea and South Korea in terms of the national system in the Asia Pacific region, there is, it's a political difference. Okay, what difference is it? What, what's really behind this? I would submit to you it is the way they treat their own people. It's human rights. That's a very inconvenient answer. And when I said that to the North Koreans, they said the natural thing is, there you go, you want to change our regime. Right? So not this, no, that's a phrase, but it's, it means something different if we do it with weapons, and if we persuade you to adopt policies that allow the United States and other countries to treat you as a normal state. Now, this does not require that you become a Jeffersonian democracy. 
right? We have wonderful relations with states who have very questionable human rights records. I can say this now, I do no longer work for the government. Saudi Arabia might be a case in point. There are others, right? So we don't need the highest standard, but we can have the North Koreans torturing their own people and doing what they do in gulags and expect a normal relationship that excludes regime change. But if they move in that direction of a normal state, then there is no political strategic reason why we couldn't have that relationship. I say again, the politics here must lead the negotiations. Can the Iran deal help on that? Can we use the Iran deal if we decide not to rip it up? I mean, there's a lot of similar language in that of trying to yeah, overthrow but the regime. We, we went to great lengths to make clear that the Iran deal, deal was not going to cure cancer, change the, the, the nature of the regime, improve all kinds of It was really focused on something very narrow. Did we hope and do we hope that over time more may come from this? Yes. But I think you have to be careful about what you're doing. And I, I don't know that I want to make the Iran deal the model here. Just something to build on. Jump pour up. You talked about South Korea, and I have been reading about the speculation that the new president of South Korea has indicated he might want to talk with the North Koreans. And I'm wondering what that means for us, for that part of the world. And can you maybe speculate on that? Um, the new president of South Korea is, I think, correctly, would be correctly characterized as a centrist. And he's not Kim Dae-jung reborn. There may be a new sunshine policy of sorts there. And he clearly has an, a, 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 an inclination in a direction of negotiations and an and and engagement with the North as a, a strategy, as opposed to, for example, tougher sanctions right off the bat. Um, in, I, I actually don't, I think I have a better grip on his new administration than ours. I, 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 really, I really don't know whether Secretary, Ta Secretary of State, for example, uh, is interested uh, in uh, engagement before tougher sanctions or not. Uh, my own view is if, if we go to the sanctions route now, uh, it will put off engagement for a period of time. They don't like to be threatened just before we go for talks, and neither do we. But of course, they are doing missile tests right now, and that makes it inconvenient, actually, as in terms of atmospherics, to begin engagement. So. I, I think to go to your point about the South, the South Korean leadership, there's been a clear shift to the left after this uh, election, the left being a, a more of a sunshine policy. And it'll be interesting to see what comes out of the summit in June. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, what do you feel should be done about the nuclear weapons that the United States has t t stockpiled in Turkey. Uh, do we have nuclear weapons in Turkey? I, I could not possibly confirm. <laughs> but I can ask to answer a hypothetical question. Okay, I thought we had some that were basically undeliverable on Air As Force bases. As the former US ambassador to NATO, he has to be very careful about oh. what he says. Uh -huh. So let's assume we would have nuclear weapons in Turkey. If Maybe there were nuclear weapons If there were Turkey. nuclear weapons in Maybe Turkey. somewhere around 50 years or so. Um, no, not that many. If there were that many, there wouldn't be that many. Uh, uh, the, I mean, the United States uh, has nuclear weapons deployed for use of U.S. aircraft and non-U.S. aircraft in a number of NATO countries. Uh, and it has um, uh, suggested that the way in which we can strengthen deterrence is by having countries who are directly on the front line participate in the mission of deterrence. Um, as a means for reassuring these countries that if we were ever to have to use nuclear weapons, we might actually say, do this, this incredible act. The act of a country like the United States using nuclear weapons to defend another country that is being attacked, even if it's not necessarily attacked by nuclear weapons. It's a pretty remarkable 
uh, unique, uh, unheard of uh, uh, idea that we would threaten nuclear war to defend another country. The way to make that more credible is to deploy nuclear weapons, we have decided for a long time, in the countries that are most vulnerable. Um, and not only do we want to make it credible, we actually don't want those countries to acquire nuclear weapons. There's a good question here. What country do you feel will be the next to acquire nuclear weapons? My worry is that countries that have long relied on the United States for their nuclear protection may for some reason maybe because the United States is no longer serious about their nuclear protection, acquire nuclear weapons. The way we, the United States, have prevented countries like Germany, Japan, South Korea, Turkey, from acquiring nuclear weapons is by saying, we'll take care of them. We'll be there. With the Japanese and the South Koreans, it hasn't always required the actual presence of American nuclear weapons on their territory. For the Europeans until today, it has helped to have nuclear weapons on their territory. So in answering the question on Turkey, we have to answer, ask the question, what is Turkey going to do if it doesn't think that the United States is going to be an ally in a region that is pretty da da dangerous? Might Turkey make the same sort of calculation that we have just talked about the North Koreans make? And what does that mean? And is it perhaps worth having, if we did, have nuclear weapons on the territory of Turkey, protected under US custody in US protected vaults, to prevent that from happening, when the alternative is Turkey requiring its own nuclear weapons, and then having to learn all the things that we have learned for a long time? Because I, I, I completely agree with, with Bob that, that what I worry about most is people who don't know how to live with nuclear weapons getting the responsibility for uh, authorizing their use. That's what's dangerous. It's that, that's, 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 that gets you into a different, into a different ball game. So while well, I'm certainly not an apologist for Turkey uh, and its uh, recent policies and uh, of a developments on a political nature. That's part of the equation we have to take into account when we think about nuclear weapons. The United States has been the biggest, despite the fact of it having as many nuclear weapons as it has, has been the biggest um, country in preventing other countries from acquiring nuclear weapons through the provision of extended deterrence. And in Europe and in Asia, it's been a really major part of the stability of the, of the world order, and particularly the stability of the nuclear order. And we ought to be very careful before we change that and look at the situation in which these countries live before we change it. Scott, did you want to jump in on, it looks like you want to jump in on that. Well, we, we are largely in, in agreement, but this is one area where I think I do disagree with, with Evo, and, and it, it's important. I think this question is a really important one, and you should be uh, congratulated for recognizing that there's a real problem. Uh, it has been widely reported, I'm not a former ambassador to NATO, that there are nuclear weapons at the Interlake Air Force Base. It's been widely reported that part of the coup attempt against the Turkish government were officers at the Interlake Base. And there have been, obviously, we know, a number of terrorist incidents inside Turkey in recent years. That's not a good recipe for extended deterrence being the priority at this point. If there is a particular base that we worry about, I think our priority should be to get weapons out of there quickly and take the long-term problem of trying to reassure the Turks that we're still on their side. It's just that we don't think we need to have those weapons there at this particular time. We took weapons out of South Korea. It didn't end our relationship with South Korea. So I think you can imagine a different set of priorities that could make us want to rebase our weapons in some different ways. So I, 
if you listen to what both my colleagues have said, it's, this is pretty simple, as opposed to everything else we've done tonight. Nuclear weapons, our nuclear weapons, other things being equal, it's better that we, it's like saying it's better that we have less rather than more. It's better that it be on U.S. soil rather than overseas. First point. Second point, if in order to discourage the acquisition of nuclear weapons by more countries, basing our weapons in another country is the only way to do it, I mean, this could, paren, suppose the ROC, the Republic of Korea, South Korea, comes to us and says, now that the North Koreans, if this should happen, can reach the United States with a nuclear weapon, we're really going to trust your extended deterrent and continue our posture of being a non-nuclear weapon state if you will once again base nuclear weapons, your nuclear weapons, on our territory. Then I would say, well, best if we didn't have to do that. But if that's what it takes, I probably would go in that direction. In other words, I, there is a, a real concern in some countries, and Turkey being would be high on the list, countries in terms of nuclear security of our weapons not ending up in, in the wrong hands um, if they're deployed overseas, and we get better nuclear security if they're deployed in the United States. But if, the, if this is what it takes to have the credibility behind our extended deterrent, then I could be persuaded. So, I'm sorry, so what are you, what are you saying? So, who are you agreeing with? <laughs> it <laughs> depends. It depends. It depends on the I mean, I, I would rather move uh, well, US nuclear we've got weapons a back into yeah, South Korea got a than have South Korea get its own nuclear right. weapons. So but so what's that. your answer to her on uh, currently with nuclear weapons in Turkey? That's the part I wasn't uh, sure. Well, I mean, uh, Evo should answer this, but you, when you remove, this is uh, in, a, in a, somebody has called this the wedding band issue. The wedding band issue means that if, in some societies, if you wear a wedding band, it's important and, and it means fidelity. In other societies, if you don't wear a wedding band, it's, it doesn't mean anything. It's, it's, you still can have fidelity. However, when someone takes off their wedding band, then you start to have some concern. And it's the same thing with nuclear weapons. If at a, at a moment here, I mean, you could have very credible assurances without nuclear weapons present. But if you remove them all of a sudden and the circumstances aren't right, then you can get people to start wondering whether the, your assurance is credible or not. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm with Bob and I, I, I don't disagree with Scott at all. I, I'm on record, it's been long been, in favor of removing nuclear weapons, US nuclear weapons from Europe. Uh, tried to uh, affect that as a US ambassador in NATO. Uh, with great success, obviously. Um, but the circumstance today is a little different than even it was in 09 or, or 13 when I was in NATO, let alone at the time when we removed nuclear weapons from South Korea. And it's in that circumstance that you have to weigh the very important consideration that Scott points out. What's the safety and security of the weapons that you have there versus the, the, the deterrent value of having and uh, it's much easier to say, well, the safety and security is more important when there is really no security concern, 09, to today when you have, in the, in the Turkish case, Syrian and Russian air forces on your border, uh, none of them nuclear threatened, but who knows, and that in, in Europe you are again worried about deterrence in a way you weren't before. So you have to start weighing it. And it's a very legitimate question to ask it uh, and to have this kind of debate. I, if you're worried about the security, I would also argue, there are other ways you can increase your security. Uh, they're, 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 you can put more US forces in the neighborhood. You can have new protocols for defending uh, uh, the, the sites that you have. You can have bigger vaults, which we actually did in the last 20, uh, 15 years, created new vaults in which you stored the nuclear weapons, et cetera. Uh, but it, it, it shows you that this is, this is not an easy uh, policy issue where nuclear weapons, bad, let's get rid of them, good. Uh, in some ways, sometimes, some nuclear weapons, having them for some places and some, uh, for some situations that may be good because the alternative is much worse. So we've come to the end of our time. I want to say two things um, before we close out. One, thank you very much to our, our panelists. I think 
one of the things that I come away with from this conversation is that while these are very serious, sobering, and dangerous kind of issues and conversations, and we're unfortunately revisiting them, there are a way to break them down into public policy discussions that should we be afforded the opportunity um, could be um, provide a, a, an or, organizing our thoughts on what's happening and maybe begin to suggest ways for moving out of this very dangerous situation. So thank you to the panelists on, on that. I do want to um, give a shameless plug because I can't help myself. On Friday at the Museum of Science and Industry, um, we at the Bulletin are opening up a um, exhibit called Turn Back the Clock. And what that exhibit is, is an effort to try to bring the tens of thousands of school kids who go through the museum to begin thinking about how do they, what's their contribution to make this world a safer place? And what we heard tonight is thankfully, we do have leaders who have thought about these issues, but there's a whole generation of ki kids coming up who haven't. And so that's part of our effort to begin in a, ver in a very gentle way to have them begin thinking about the, what their contribution is to making a safer and healthier planet. It'll be open for a year, so please come see us. With that shameless plug, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking. Thank you.